Where in the world is Jamie Almanzan? I need a big red fedora, right? Isn't that that she wore? Was it I was in elementary it? school when you could earn a little time on the Commodore 64 to play Where in the <laughs> World is Carmen San Diego? If you had finished the Commodore 64, I deeply remember that. He's gone Name from Redmond to Ben to the deep. She got to go everywhere. What was her job? What was Carmen's job? Did she just get to travel? Uh, I think we were all being prepped for the CIA. I can see that's a conversation killer. Okay, seriously, where are you right now? I'm in Portland, Oregon. Our work takes us all over Oregon. I'm really grateful for the partnerships that we've developed. We are. This piece of work is a partnership with the Multnomah Clackamas REN, Regional Educator Network. We got into it originally to develop a leadership network for equity directors in districts in both Multnomah and Clackamas counties. And so people who are in that position came together to get collegial support. That was the baseline of it. Like talk to other people who are doing this job. So many districts will often use their funds to create a very small department. It could be one person. It could be two, maybe three Sometimes we're able to get an assistant director. Sometimes those roles get expanded to, you're you're now in charge of the McKinney-Vento Act. You're now in charge of disciplinary hearings. You're now in charge of all these things can be, and look, I'm guilty, but that's why I know how it's done because- I didn't make the department (laughs) large. I had a whole side of the building. So, so But your work with the Equity Collaborative, I think is super important. And so for those who are out there- You never talk about, you say we, and I really feel like it's important to talk about what Uh, your day job is when you're not on the podcast, is that you're doing some really important work out there. I'm lucky to have people who are interested in getting some coaching support and coaching leadership development. So supporting people to be coaches, supporting leaders, even superintendents to take a coaching stance in how they lead from a place of curiosity as opposed to a hierarchy. And that can make such a difference for how people experience leadership in their system. Superintendents that do that, oh my goodness, it's it's fabulous. It cre- it's like a, it creates this ripple effect of like, well, gosh, he's great. He or she's great. She asks us questions. I'm like, excellent. I am so happy that she asks questions. So this obviously makes you think about our guest today, Dr. Rachel White, professor at the University of Texas in Austin. And Rachel listens. This is her job. She listens and she gathers experiences. You're so right. She listens. And that is a big function of the work that she does. And as she listens, she learns. And as she listens and learns, she's also being able to weave in or stitch in what she has learned about the experience and what she has seen in terms of the data. And so I find this work that she's doing with the superintendent lab just brilliant. She's addressing the lack of comprehensive data on superintendents. She is emphasizing the role as this central hub for data analysis, insight generation, research dissemination. So many of us, as we write our master's thesis or our doctoral thesis, the work that we do it as a stepping stone towards this next part of our career. And she's saying, well, hold on a second. That is such valuable research and we need to get it out there. I love that as well. I totally agree. There were so many little ideas that I loved. Just tons. Well, I'm going to make you hold off and wait. Let me have my conversation with Dr. Rachel White, then we'll come back together and we'll keep talking. You're listening to An Imperfect Leader, the Superintendents and Leadership Podcast. Imperfect leaders, are you facing challenges filling open speech language pathologist positions within your district? Kind of a silly question because I know you are. Empat Speech understands the critical need for qualified professionals in your schools. They recognize that communication lies at the heart of academic success, and that's why they're dedicated to helping you bridge the gap by offering expert therapists and innovative telehealth solutions. Don't let open positions hinder your students' success. Partner with Empat Speech today and ensure every child in your district has access to the speech therapy they deserve. Empat Speech. E M. PATSpeech.com. Empowering students, empowering schools. Today on An Imperfect Leader, Dr. Rachel White is my guest. And Dr. White is an associate professor of educational leadership and policy studies at the University of Texas, Austin. Rachel, welcome to An Imperfect Leader. Thank you, Peter. I'm really excited to be here. 
Well, I am so pleased to meet you because I don't know if you recognize this, but I've been emailing you for like a year now. And that's because I think your research interests continuously grab my attention. Every time I email you, you're so willing uh, to engage and to explain. And for that, I'm so grateful. One incredible research that I want to make sure that superintendents who listen each week that they know about and that you put together is something called the Superintendent Lab. And I'll put a link in the show notes. I wonder if you could start there. Maybe tell us just a little bit about the Superintendent Lab and what you mean by, I read these, the tenets of revealing, humanizing, and training. Yeah, so the lab was really something that I developed because I just felt like there was no resource like this available to folks in the field. So back in 2018, I received a grant from the Spencer Foundation to do this research on how superintendents make sense of and then actually engage in state policy processes. I'm a mixed methodologist by training. And so I had promised to do interviews with superintendents. And then I was like, I'll do this national survey of superintendents and better understand how frequently they engage with state policymakers, the ways they engage with state policymakers. So I did all of my interviews. Then I was going to move on to the survey. And I thought I could go to the U.S. Department of Education's website, download a spreadsheet and have the names and email addresses of every superintendent in the nation right there at my disposal. So I scoured the U.S. Department of Education website for a good day, tried to find every resource that I could and just realized that didn't exist. And so I was like, well, I guess I'll just do it myself. And so I started building that data set myself. What I did is I downloaded a list of every district in the United States and then went state by state, all 12,500 plus superintendents in the United States. So I did that. And as I was doing that, I honestly just got really frustrated because it felt like every other person that I was entering into the database had a first name that was either John or Matthew or Michael. And I was like, oh my gosh, there are so many Johns and so many Michaels. And I knew that I knew of the research about the gender gap in the superintendency, but it was just so stark when you collect nearly 13,000 names, like how many of them have those names. And so I wrote this little article based on first names and it was like one in five superintendents has one of these names. And people were like, wow, this is really interesting. And we've never had the national data before. And so I was like, well, I'll just keep collecting it because it doesn't exist. So I'll build some sort of need. So I've been collecting that data now ever since 2019, I have five years of data. And most of it is hand collected just because it's really it is really challenging. Some states have zero data accumulated around superintendents. And then, like I said, many states delay the release of the most up-to-date data or they don't tell you the last time it was released. So you might be able to download a spreadsheet, but it may be from May of 2020 and you just don't know. So my team did that. So that was the, the beginning of a lot of this work. And then what I realized is that there just wasn't a lot of data at all about superintendents. And so the purpose of the lab was really to be a central hub of data, but then also data analysis. What are the insights and innovations that could potentially come out of having this national data? But I also do a lot of work that is interviewing superintendents, doing focus groups with superintendents that maybe we can get into a little bit more later. So that's the basis for the superintendent lab is just to be a public resource where people can go see what the latest trends are using some of this data, but also access other resources um, around superintendent research. And not just my research, I try to make sure that I'm elevating the research of other folks, particularly elevating the research of doctoral students, because there's a lot of really amazing aspiring superintendents and superintendents that end up doing dissertations on the superintendency that never really make it out into the world. And so I try to be good about anytime a, a doc student reaches out to me and is like, hey, are you in the lab? Can we talk? I'm doing my dissertation. I always try to make sure that if they're doing their dissertation on superintendents, that um, I stay in touch with them. And then once they have some findings, I can share those out. So not only doing work, um, research on the superintendency, but being in community with people doing work on the superintendency and particularly with current and aspiring superintendents who are doing really great work. That's really interesting. I think that's really important because I think so many of whether they're assistant soups or soups who are working on their dissertations and what they have that potentially researchers don't have is they have a relationship with their communities. And so it's very possible that people will go a little bit deeper and reveal a little bit more about their hopes and fears and their dreams and, and all of that for their community, particularly for those who are doing qualitative research, to really get beyond the surface and be able to then maybe, if you're doing mixed methodology, to be able to look at what does the data say in terms of the quantitative piece, 
and does it match what people are saying kind of piece. So I think it's really interesting. I'm glad that you're doing this work because um, I know a number of deans uh, in colleges of ed who wow. would say to me that, yeah, the, these dissertations are pretty interesting, could be incredibly revealing and could move the field. And yeah. they don't really go very far because it is a stepping stone for that superintendent to do that work because they're passionate about it. And then they yeah. get their degree and they, they put it to the side because the work of the superintendent is yeah. pretty involved in its own right. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that also gets at those three tenants that you were talking about. Revealing, right? I got into using data to reveal new insights about the superintendency and really have some data-driven dialogue to advance policies and practices. I partner with a lot of state associations and school administrators, as well as the National Association, AASA, to bring some new and unique data and insights for them to think about policy priorities moving forward. The humanizing aspect of it is the mixed methods aspect is that we have this big national data set that a lot of people are, have a lot of interest in. But what I have seen is in particular, both researchers and policymakers and then people on the ground, there's um, been a little bit of a dehumanization of the superintendency, I believe, um, particularly in our, our current rich, incredibly politicized context where we don't see that person as someone with feelings and emotions with a family that also has to care for their own well-being. And so the mixed methods part of my research is really important because those stories and that humanization of the data is important. And then even with the the big national data set, the humanization of that data is, is a big passion point of mine because I know every single one of those data points is not just a widget. It is a person. And I think sometimes in the research world, we can get caught up and saying, oh, that's a lot of data. We could do a lot of cool things with that. Let's connect the this data to that data. And I am very cautious about why we're connecting two data sets. I think you need to have a really strong theory of action of why you would connect the superintendent attrition data to some outcome data that you want to collect or that's easily available. Um, I have this mantra that I talk to my grad students about it. That's just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so I'm um, really just realizing that every one of these data points is a human being and that we need to be really respectful of this data and not just throw things out into the world without thinking really deeply and critically about how it's going to impact the superintendents as people. And so there's that piece. And then the training piece for the lab is that I have anywhere from four to six undergraduate researchers that work with me and then graduate student researchers that work with me as well. And my goal is really to provide students at all levels with really rigorous research training opportunities. I'm a first-gen college grad, and I had no idea that research was a profession that you were going to go into. And when I was at the University of Michigan as an undergrad, I did in my freshman year, it was called Europe, the University Research Opportunity Program. It was for work-study students, and I got the opportunity to work with a professor who did research. And I didn't realize that until now that that might have been that first opportunity that I was like, what's research? And so I tried to make sure that the, the lab is a training grounds for people to really see that this can be an area that they could potentially pursue as a career. And I try to really bring in um, students, particularly from historically underrepresented groups in this area. So education policy is getting more diverse, but has been heavily white and male. And so most of my research assistants, um, I try to really focus on bringing in women um, as research assistants but also students from underrepresented groups um, that identify with the LGBTQ community, um, that identify as Black or Hispanic, and other folks that maybe um, don't get these opportunities as much. If you're just joining us, our guest today is Dr. Rachel White, Associate Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of Texas, Austin. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to dig into this a little bit more in the leadership model that I use to advise others, uh, which really anchors itself into uh, educational leadership research. There's a dimension called the leader's learning work, and, and that's like the mind of an organization's work. So you have the heart, you have the muscle, and you have the mind. And inside that dimension, there's this term, applying system design and structure. And your research centers around, as you indicated, um, a real passion for issues of power, voice, diversity, inclusion in educational policymaking and implementation processes. And then also examining the structures and policies that contribute to or, or counteract equitable and socially just K-12 education. And when I think about a system's design, I think about the fact that a system structure, which includes its policy, creates its behaviors. And you've been a school board member, I know, 
vice president of a board, and uh, you've been a high school coach, which I think really speaks to, as you indicated earlier, that essentially that these numbers, that, that they represent people, their hopes, their dreams. And I think you have an intimate and, and real personal feeling about that because of your service. And now you study school leadership full-time. So, oh, and you were a policy analyst in Michigan. So my question has to do with systems. What are you observing? Like everything from the portraits of superintendents, their relationship to their school boards, when it comes to why superintendents leave the profession, I know that is a, a particular interest for a lot of people. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think I, I love this idea of sort of the heart and the, the soul and the mind of, of systems that you talk about and thinking about the system design and structure. And for me, pol policy can really make or break um, a system. And policy, I think, is an opportunity to create a really strong system. I try to shift people's mindsets away from policy as being a stick rather than a carrot. I think good policy often allows you to really hone in on the strengths of your community if you know how to use it. And so when I think about the systems perspective around superintendents, I think there's a lot of policies that potentially could be improved to improve superintendent well-being and superintendent burnout. And then also thinking about inequities and inequalities in the pathways to and through the superintendency. And so when I think about the portrait of superintendents, I think there's a long way to go. I think we often talk about how the teaching workforce is 70 plus percent women, right? Principal workforce is about 60-ish percent women. And we get up to the superintendency and it's about 28% women. And so why is that? If we look at race, we see very similar numbers. It's lower at each level for a lot of reasons, including intentional discrimination and, and uh, bias in the, the workforce, but it's just dismal numbers when it comes to superintendents of color leading systems. And I think that's really concerning <laughs> than that, um, given what our student population works looks like. And for me, the, the portrait of a superintendent, I think about both mirrors and windows. And so me, as a, as a little girl in a, a rural town in Michigan where I grew up, I never saw women in leadership positions. I saw them in the principalship, right? But I didn't, I never had a woman superintendent in my district. And being from a small town, I never saw women in any leadership positions, right? City government, any of the businesses in town, very infrequently that I ever see a woman leading something. And so what does that do to, to a little girl's psyche in terms of knowing and understanding where they're welcome and what sorts of careers they maybe should pursue that, that seem feasible. And so. Right. And what, and what the community seems to be suggesting about what is your place? With your place. And, and, yeah. and I imagine that you also then encourage others to think about who it is working in the role of nutrition services, who is your custodian, who is, yeah. and what are their identities that they bring to that yeah. place? And what yeah. does that suggest to children about who leads and who doesn't? Yeah, so that would be the mirrors part of this. You can see yourself potentially in, in others um, who are leading. And so many of us don't see that. Um, and then the windows piece is the people that are leading that others can't, understand the world through them, right? By looking through them. And so if we have a, a Latina woman leading a school district, like she's come to that position with very particular life experiences, she may think about policy quite differently. And she is a window to help others see the world through her experiences, right? And people will never be able to truly understand her lived experience, but they, they help them understand why they may change the dress code to be more inclusive and culturally respectful and responsive to students. And so I think about the portrait of the superintendent and through this, the, the importance of windows and mirrors. And right now we don't have a lot of either because <laughs> in the superintendency. And of course we want the best people in those positions. And people sometimes push back on that. Don't you just want the best person? And I said, yes, absolutely. And I see there are so many women and so many leaders of color who are the best person in one, they're either, they're deciding not to pursue the position for a variety of reasons, many of which are society telling them you're not ready yet. You're not prepared yet. You need more education. You need more experience. And so they, they don't per pursue the position until later in life. And so that's one reason. Other reasons are throughout, throughout the hiring process. What we find. I was thinking you're talking about mirrors and I thought to myself, if you look at the identities of the school board, it becomes a hall of mirrors. And then they say, well, 
who is the best fit as we all look around and see yep, only yep. ourselves in this space. So who's the yep. best fit? Oh, I think we know who's the, the best fit. Let's give this person the very best chance. You know? yeah. Or if they do take a leap of faith as they might consider it, how quickly they will revert back to, and I think I saw this in your own research, when a leader of color does leave that district, they are often replaced or a woman who in leadership who often replaces them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there's a double-edged sword because you do find that women and leaders of color come to this position later in life. And so then the school board is thinking, oh, well, if they're, this is like their last stop and they're only going to be here for three or four years, do we want that person or do we want the young guy, right? <laughs> maybe in the early 40s who maybe we'll be able to keep for seven or eight years. But that young guy maybe was a teacher for a year or two and then an athletic director for a year or two, but they end up getting chosen over the person that maybe has 20 years of classroom experience, maybe was the director of curriculum instruction, all of these things. And there's some other research. It's older from the early 90s, maybe early 2000s that did a little bit of work with school boards as they were hiring. And it, it was, it is shocking some of the things that they were able to capture where the school board members are even saying things like, well, we need someone who's going to understand finance and we need someone who's going to be able to jump in and fix the bus if it's broken down. And that is a reason for picking a man. So, so many women who are so good at school finance, and I can tell you right now, like I, I bet you I can go out and fix a tire on a bus just as capable as, as any other male superintendent. And so those are the types of things that I think we really have to work through and why doing the research on the superintendency is really important. But it, we can't just say superintendents have to change. We have to change the system. Yeah, right. I think that gets at some of these other things you're talking about on relationships with school boards and why superintendents are leaving the profession. I can tell you that relationships with school boards is one of the number one reasons why superintendents are leaving the profession. Um, because they're having to do things that uh, they feel have very little to do with the education of students. That they have, but their position has become more and more politicized. I've had really deep conversations with superintendents who feel like they are having to put out public statements on political events. And they have said, This is my sphere of influence. I have no control over these things. And yet I'm feeling such pressure either from community or my board to step up and say something. And then am I saying something for every event that happened everywhere? That exactly. Then you open Pandora's box and if you make exactly. statements, then the next time something happens and you don't make a statement, then you're making a statement if you don't make a statement. And so you get yourself into this situation where it really is a no-win situation because if you make a statement, you're going to get in trouble by one group who doesn't agree with your statement. If you don't make a statement, you're going to get in trouble with one group who wanted you to make a statement. So you really can't win. Yeah. It's really been boxed into this impossible situation where they're having to deal more and more with just the politics of both the school board, but also the community. I think getting increasingly frustrated that this is not why I got into education. I got into education for many of them initially because they wanted to connect with kids, right? Many of them start in the classroom and it's right. about... With Connect kids. the kids and elevate the amazing things that teachers do. Yeah. Because they are the ones who are actually making Administration, the right? Is yep. like yep. They, they wanted to make that impact from the systems level. They felt that they had the skill set and the wherewithal to move up and to support teachers and to support administrators. And their time is being increasingly taken up in this other area around politics, around school board member, managing school board members who are bringing sort of one-off issues. When I work with school boards, I always say like, do not be that special topics person. You do not get on the school board because of one issue. You get on the school board to represent your community, which has a lot of different interests and in issues that they want brought to the board. But you're also there to, to partner and to collaborate with the superintendent. And I think they're just created such divisiveness in many cases between school board members and superintendents. And that has shifted a, a lot of the reasons why superintendents are leaving. So within the national data set, um, we do have qualitative data. And that's one of the unique and what I think is really powerful parts of the National Longitudinal Superintendent Database. So anytime a superintendent leaves, the team of researchers, we do as much research as possible to try to identify public sources that will help us 
better understand the departure from a public perspective. I want to put that caveat out there because everyone has their own personal story about why they left. But the superintendent is a really public position. And so I think it's important that we know what the public knows about superintendent departure. We code whether or not the superintendent retired, resigned, was fired or non-renewed. Unfortunately, we have to code for things like death and arrest or conviction. So we do that set of coding. And then we also code when possible around whether or not the departure of the superintendent was what we call ostensibly amicable. So from public sources, it seems like they announced their retirement, they had a parade, they got a plaque and a little ceremony at the school board and like everything, not that everyone was like happy or sad or whatever, right? But like in general, right. it's amicable. And then we have another code that called attrition that happens in a politicized context or contentious environment. And so we look for key words within the public sources like separation agreement that the, the superintendent left under conditions that can't be discussed. Vote of no confidence from a teacher's union, from a school board. We look if there was a change.org petition circulating. Those are increasingly mm -hmm. happening around the superintendents. So anytime that happens, we code the attrition event as politicized or contentious. Not that the superintendent did anything that was political or contentious. It's that the attrition occurred in a context that was politicized or contentious. What we're seeing in that data is that superintendent attrition is increasingly taking place in politicized contexts or contentious environments in that it's not evenly distributed. Um, that women are significantly more likely to experience attrition in a politicized context or contentious environment, and that women are increasingly experiencing attrition in which there is contract non-renewal or a direct firing. And if you look at the reasons why and, and the behaviors, it's sexism, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's discrimination based on gender. And so because they're, it's not like they're committing crimes that would make them get fired. And so it's more these biases that potentially are coming into the process that are leading them to not have their contracts renewed. What does the term an imperfect leader mean to you? How does it resonate for you? For me, it resonates and that is an effective leader. When I think about the tenants of the superintendent lab, the humanizing um, tenant, when I think about imperfect, I think about human. Every human is imperfect. And I think an imperfect leader is is a human leader. And I think those are the most effective leaders because humans have feelings, they have empathy, they're able to connect with other people and understand that every single day we're going to make a mistake. And the most effective way to lead is to be able to admit that you're not going to be right all the time either. And so for me, that's what imperfect leader means. It just means that you're human. And I think a leader who can really lean in to all the facets of being human and help others lean into those facets of being human is the best leader. I want to be mindful also of something you just said in terms of women in leadership. And that question that I ask you, how does it resonate? Also need to be thoughtful of that for some leaders, they are given many more opportunities to be imperfect. And I just mm -hmm. want to be thoughtful and mindful based on what you said was so powerful in terms of who gets the second chance who is more likely to be dismissed uh, prematurely and, and not to lose sight of, of those inequities that exist. Absolutely. The voices of the women in the field are so powerful. And if, if you just brought in a group of 10 superintendents who identify as women or who identify as Black women or Latino women, Asian American women, like if you sat on a podcast with 10 of them, they could tell you stories for days of how they have been dehumanized and the ways in which they feel like they have to be perfect. And that is such a weight that sits on their shoulders every day because they not only feel like they have to be perfect for their own job security, because they know if they make one mistake that people are going to be on them like vultures, right? But they also feel like they have to be perfect for the people coming behind them. And that if the people behind them that look like them are going to have a chance there. The people in those positions now feel that that weight of having to be quote unquote perfect in order for this to be able to continue. And that should not be an additional burden that women and leaders of color have to have on their shoulders all of the time. Just because, you know, a, a woman came in and, and 
didn't, maybe they didn't match well with that culture of that school district, right? It wasn't because of the chromosomes that are in their body, right? Like that's not why they matched well or didn't match well with the district and nothing to do with that. But so frequently as humans, we see, well, we always had a man and then we hired a woman and this happened. So it had to be because she's a woman. But in many or most cases, it has nothing to do with that where we all disperse our humans. And we'll be right back. Hey, district leaders, I know you already know this. In schools worldwide, cell phones are posing real challenges on student engagement and mental well-being. And I want you to meet Yonder, a proud sponsor of an imperfect leader. And let me share this story from a visit I made to some schools in Silicon Valley. I asked some kids what they liked about Yonder. And after some funny looks, they shared that actually with Yonder, teachers don't have to battle with them over phones anymore. In fact, one kid said to me he didn't have to worry anymore about his parents texting him in class. And the kid next to him like sort of shoved him and was texting. My mom used to FaceTime me in class. I want to introduce you to a support system that increases teaching and learning. I want you to discover why a million students choose Yonder daily. Minimize distractions, maximize learning potential. To learn more, go to overyonder.com. Y-O-N-D-R. We're back for segment two of an imperfect leader called Imperfect Leadership in an Interaction. My guest today is Dr. Rachel White, a former board member, a volunteer coach, a policy analyst, an associate professor of educational leadership and policy studies at the University of Texas, Austin. And I am so interested to know what your topic is. So here we go. This is the segment where we ask guests to deconstruct the decision that they made. And so what happened? Yeah. So a decision that we made in a difficult situation. So earlier in the first segment, I talked about humanizing the superintendency. And since I built the national data set, there's been many opportunities to do different types of research using the data set to collaborate with different folks. And people very excitedly are, are eager about this data set because there are so many questions that have been unanswered. And so the situation that was really difficult for me was when... I was asked potentially, and this hasn't just happened once, it's happened multiple times, uh, to connect the superintendent uh, attrition data and as well as the gender and race data to student outcomes. And specifically, student outcomes being um, state standardized test scores um, of students. And I am, a, at the time, was an assistant professor, was not tenured. I'm a young woman in this field of mostly white men. And I was at the University of Tennessee and people with so much more hands than me were interested in the data set. And that was really exciting for me, but I really had to, it was a really difficult moment and it felt like a really challenging career moment for me because I don't, I don't know if listeners know, but like when I go out for a tenure, I have to have external reviewers from all over the United States that I actually can't have any contact with beforehand. And so, and I don't always know who they are. And so I'm, I'm always thinking about that, right? Like my tenure is reliant on, on people in the field that are at other institutions. And so when these opportunities arose, I really had to sit and think about what I was willing to, to do with this data and what I wasn't willing to do. I had established those three um, pillars beforehand and I'm really grateful that I established those pillars beforehand. Um, because they allowed me to really ground myself and what are my values around this data? What's my larger goal with this work? And so the thing that I learned, I think, is that establishing your why early and really reflecting on it helps you much later, oftentimes, because you're able to anchor to that. And so when folks say, would you be willing to connect this data to, to student test scores? It became easier for me to say, I right now am unwilling to do that because my understanding of the profession, both as a school board member, I'm as someone who's done at this point, probably thousands of interviews with superintendents and know them as, as people, as individuals. There's just too much that happens between a superintendent turning over or a superintendent being a woman and a kid taking a state test on one day in April where we have very little 
understanding of whether or not they had breakfast that morning, whether or not they slept in a bed in a home that had clean air the night before. Like we just, we don't know those things. And so to try to connect this X to Y when there's so much happening in between seemed, it just didn't feel right in my gut. And I think over time, those types of decisions that seemed really nerve wracking because I was like, is the, is my career hanging on this decision? I say no to someone who I think has a lot of clout or power or a, a big reputation. Am I done? <laughs> right. Because you're talking about the human piece of this work, right? So you have this one of your three tenants, you're revealing, training, and then humanizing, and then mm -hmm. recognizing the human aspect of rejection, right? So somebody is now told, no, I'm not going to give you my info or this data that I've been collecting. Yeah. And at the same time, they are then taking this as a rebuke and now you're sure. payback kind of thing. So, so it seems like you were really considering the politics of your profession and the politics of mm -hmm. higher ed. Did anything get overlooked in that decision that you made in terms of saying that this data at this time is not going to be used for that purpose? Yeah, I think if I reflect on those decisions, I think one thing that went well is that I'm still trying to keep the conversation open, right? And say, I don't see necessarily this connection, but here's something else that we could potentially consider. Maybe we think about how when a superintendent turns over, we see changes in how the next superintendent spends money on curriculum. But that's because spending is much more in the locus of control of a superintendent. Yeah, and actually spending can reveal one's values because it's how you spend your money is what you believe. So it can surely can you can take away one's identity and just say, well, look, this is clear, right? This is what they spend money on. This is what the board approved. Yeah. So I think that that's one thing that, that didn't get overlooked, but that I think went really well. I think in terms of things that like I continue to try to think about in, in moving forward is how to, as a human, not get caught up in all the emotion of, of that decision. I think oftentimes as leaders in school districts, we're really passionate about what we do. Right. Particularly <laughs> superintendents. I, you know, talked to so many superintendents and they, especially recently, some of the work I've been doing around superintendent well-being and attrition, the job's really hard and they can go on and on about the day-to-day -day challenges. But at the end of the day, they said, I wouldn't want to do anything else. I love what I do and I know it's important. And I feel like I'm very similar as a, as a researcher. I absolutely, I've never woken up a single day of my life and been like, oh, like I have to go to work. I love what I do. It's so well, very clear by, by your energy in this conversation, clearly that this work is important to you. My ask is, did you, what did you learn about relationships or what new relationships may have been formed through this whole process? Yeah, yeah. Collecting your data and then making these decisions. For me, relationships are everything. And I think doing the mixed methods research is really important for me because it helps me see and develop relationships with the people in the field to truly understand what's going on. I could look at newspaper articles all day and read them and try to understand the reasons why superintendents turn over, but it's being in the field. It's going to the state association, a school administrator conferences, right? Where I get to sit at tables with superintendents and hear um, the challenges they're experiencing and the joy they're experiencing. Like it's not just about what is pushing them out, but what is keeping them there? and what is keeping them in their district, but also what's keeping them in the profession. I've been to many uh, state associations, women's conferences, and it's those relationships with women that are in the superintendency have been so critical to not only the way that I see the data, but they those are what actually inform the, the next analysis. And so I am really intentional about being in the field as much as possible. A lot of flying and a lot of being in different places but I wouldn't have it any other way because I will not be that professor that's sitting here in my office coming up with problems that I think exist whenever I'm out in the field. I'm always asking what data I have or what like research I've been doing. What's next? What would be most helpful for you? Those relationships are so important because I, I also want that to be reciprocal. And so they're helping me as as a researcher say, here's what's really important to the field. But it's also then me returning 
the findings, helping them think about the ways that potential policy changes that could happen, that could improve the conditions. So me also serving as a partner, a collaborator in this reciprocal relationship. Sure. Yeah. Almost as a convener, right? I think of uh, Christina Kishimoto's organization, which I'm sure you're really familiar with, and working together to bring leaders, particularly women, together to do what I think you're describing, which is not just looking at what isn't going well, but rather pulling that back and saying, let's look at this through an appreciative lens. What's going well? How do we get more of it? Because it's through that continued success that we will success breed success kind of thing. Seems like yeah. that's where your the research, where your research is going. Yeah. Actually, the superintendent lab has a formal partnership with Voice for Equity. With, with oh, great. That was good. And I think that's the other thing about relationships is that it took a little bit for me to decide how I wanted to engage in those partnerships and what was important to me in formalizing a partnership. But with folks like Christina, she is someone who is so human. From the first time that I met her, she, we met at a little cafe in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and within two minutes, I was like, she is the real deal. She's so genuine and she's very open and honest about she's there to elevate women, um, and particularly women of color in this profession. And she has so much empathy and, and she's brilliant, right? Like she's been in these seats before. She knows what these superintendents are experiencing. And so that relational piece to even in this, these partnerships is really important in terms of who I've been able to partner with and develop really trusting, deep relationships with. And Christina is one of the best. Before we end, I'd like to ask just one last question. And that is, in so many communities, the school district is the largest employer. And when legislation is being proposed at the state level, legislators will seek the advice of their superintendents. And superintendents aren't just, they're not necessarily comfortable. They don't know how to engage their legislators around policy, around legislation. And so I wonder, what's one piece of advice that you would give to them? One piece of advice is be confident. Know that your experiences, the story that you can tell, the personal story that you can tell from your district are really powerful in the policy process. And so I have a couple of pieces of research out there that show that state policymakers want to hear from you. They have said that. They want to hear from you. And then I think just quickly, the second piece is don't be a no person. When I was working with the Michigan Association of School Administrators, that was the important part of policy engagement is that you can't just contact your legislator when you're mad or when you don't like a piece of legislation. And political party aside, right, you have to learn to work with your legislator, but not just your legislator, you gotta learn to work with the, the members of the education committee and the chair of the education committee, whether or not they're your legislator or not, if they're chair of the education committee, they're chairing a statewide committee and they you need to be in contact with them um, because they wanna hear from you. <laughs> uh, Such great advice, that's really so good. So don't just be a no person, be in contact with them all the time. And even if you don't always agree with them politically, if they pass something that's like, okay, like I can get on board with that, email them, call them and say, hey, Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I really thought that was a good piece of legislation. That's how you build relationships and relationships that are respectful, where that they know that you're not just playing politics. You're really thinking deeply about the content of the policy, not about the political party of who's passing the policy. My guest today was Dr. Rachel White, Associate Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of Texas, Austin. And Rachel, I, I want to thank you for a few things. One, I want to thank you for reminding us really about the value of policy and that they often reflect the community's values. And so they ought to be reviewed and, and examined that once something is passed 50 years ago, it's probably reasonable to look at it again and see, does it reflect our current values? Thank you for also reminding us about the burden of being a trailblazer and the responsibility that brings. And then truly for the three tenets about revealing, humanizing, and training, I think any one of us can take those as values that we could take to our jobs. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Peter, for having me. Okay, we are back. What a great conversation. There are so many different ways that we can talk about what we just heard. So there are a couple of things. I do want to talk about the experience in terms of humanizing the superintendency. I want to talk about the politics involved in being a superintendent in terms of attrition. I want to talk about the gender and racial disparities. I think also there's a part I know that you mentioned when we talked with Kim Marshall, 
you talked about what is considered the best. And I have a feeling yeah. you're going to have some additional thoughts around what does that it mean I to do, be the best. Peter, that I do. I giggle because oppression is so predictable. It's so consistent. It's so the same thing. I'm like, and it's like, oh, you can see that train is on time every day. No problem. Like you will, is that train is never late. Racism is doing fine. Oh my goodness gracious. The, what did she say? She said, you know, that she gets ass and the research. Well, don't we just want to hire the best person? Oh, I've heard that argument two billion times. Don't we just want, what's best? What does best mean? I must what's say, I'm going to, so when she mentioned mirrors and windows, I had to chuckle listening to it again because um, I was so proud of my sort of, and when you're in a boardroom and it's a hall of mirrors, oh. I was like, I wrote that. That's what I wrote. Peter, I did my best to catch up and write with it. I wrote that quote. I was like, that is dead on. That whole uh, board, they just look at each other and then they say, huh. Is the board, is a mixed political board, even just forget just politics. How about mixed gender, mixed race? As mixed as you can, better. It certainly will make meetings longer. That's for sure. But man, what an opportunity to connect across difference. What an opportunity for multiple ways of thinking. This reminds me of a district that we work with, again, here in Oregon. I remember we were coaching them and they were shifting policy. They were looking at their retention rates, hiring and retention rates. And they decided to set an audacious goal to have their new hires match the demographic of the students they served. And they were pretty much split, 50% white, 50% Latino. That's pretty much the district that they were. And so one of the hires, that one of the early hires of this process after the goal was set was they had a front office in the district office. The main person at the front desk was retiring. She had been there, a white woman who had been there forever, loved everything. Great, she's wonderful, but she's leaving. So they have to hire a new person. And it's very clear that the woman who's retiring says, you need a Spanish speaker here. And half the families that come in speak only Spanish. And I'm basically useless for that, for this thing. So they say, you're right, you're right. This is really important. So they go through the whole process. They interview a bunch of people. Comes down to a Spanish speaking person and an English only speaking person. Spanish speaking person is bilingual. English only speaking is speaks only English. But the English only speaking person no, is from within the system and knows everything that job basically needs to do. Bilingual person knows nothing outside of the system, knows nothing about how the job to do, but speaks Spanish. And they debated forever. Like, well, it would be so much faster if we just picked the person who already knows how to do all the things. Right. But earlier you said it was most important that the community that you serve is represented by this person who's sitting in the front. And that person who's totally qualified, the English only person is extremely qualified in everything, except she's terrible at speaking Spanish. She's literally the worst possible choice. Why are we diminishing the very thing that we said is the most important? And that shifted their mind. They really debated and they hired the Spanish speaking person because they decided, actually, I think we can train this person to do this stuff. It'll take longer, but the thing that we're struggling with, we no longer have to have a second person in the office to translate. And they hired a Spanish speaking person. Was, how did this we, conversation with Rachel, how did it make you think of that story? Because that question of, don't you just want the best person? It, what's the best? What does best mean? They changed their hiring policy in that district to require bilingualism in any language for positions. And it shifted the entire experience for the Spanish speaking families in that district. I love this story. It makes me I love so that. like, ah, like look at that. You're speaking oh. also to how she described the importance of humanizing yeah. our experiences in schools. So for families in the end of your story there in terms of if someone has had to labor to learn English, which is such a difficult language, and labor to learn a system that is fairly foreign and unpredictable in so many ways, that having someone there who can humanize the parent is super important. And then 
I think of that in terms of how Rachel spoke so intently about the value of humanizing the superintendency and the importance of recognizing that superintendents are individuals. They have feelings. They have families. They have, how did that, all that make you feel? Oh my God. Are you I'm like kidding? you as a superintendent? I'm so interested in it. Like, what did that must have made Peter feel so good? What did that make you feel? You know, it's interesting you should say that. It definitely made me feel seen. And at the same time, I realize in some ways that I'm still working through some stuff. But we're going to have to unpack that on another episode. So what else jumped out to you? I, what I loved, what really got me jazzed was, well, for first the data about 28% women in the superintendency. And then the numbers being even lower for people of color, for leaders of color. And then the comment about many folks coming to that position later in life. And uh, I was like, no crap. Internalized belief systems that I'm not paired yet. I'm not smart enough yet. Um, then they struggle forever to get a superintendency, finally get a superintendency, only to be ousted quickly and replaced by, what she say, the athletic director? She definitely, oh my goodness gracious, so horrible. Had no fear in terms of telling us exactly what the data say. And Wait, John, amazing. Mike, and Eric? Was it John, yes. Mike, and Eric or something like that? That had to be so astounding to her. To your point, though, in terms of being replaced, she said, I, this is a quote I wrote down. And so what we're seeing in that data is that the superintendent attrition is increasingly becoming, increasingly taking place in politicized contexts or contentious environments. And that it's not evenly distributed, that women are significantly more likely to experience attrition in a politicized context or contentious environment. And that women are increasingly experiencing more likely experiencing attrition in which there's a contract non-renewal or just direct firing. I have friends who absolutely have gone through this as brilliant superintendents, incredible track record, what a legacy for their communities, and absolutely were unceremoniously dismissed and then asked to continue to help the new person with their transition. To me, it was astounding. She said, every one of these data points is a human being. Let's not just throw these things out into the world without thinking about that impact. That is a person, not just data points. That's right. I thought, yes. I, caught, I also love the way she started to realize, ah, no, I'm not sharing that. I'm never, yes. Wasn't that amazing? And she weighed the fact that, hey, look, I need to get tenure. The way that this game is played is that my file is going to get sent to people who do similar work. And if they are individuals who have asked me for my data and I have said no, what might happen in terms of their own recommendations about the work that I do and whether or not it's important and how that might impact getting tenure? Yeah, that was interesting. And the system stays pumping along. No problem. She's weighing this thing. I have to get tenure through this system that isn't at, go, directly opposed to what I believe would be the most humanizing way support the research that I created. I, the last one that I thought was really, that, that touched me was about policy. When she talked about, she said, good policy often allows you to hone in on the strengths of your community. And it made me think of the difference between school boards and leaders that set policy based on what they care about as opposed to policy opposes things. It stated about like, know that, know this. When you state it the opposite way and you say, we care about X, it's almost as if it's a, what I would call a positive prime. It's that it causes us to think about all the ways that we can make X happen, as opposed to go looking for all the ways that we need to prevent Y from happening. Yes, and she brings this role as a researcher and then also as a former school board member as well as a previous policy writer for an association. And yes. that sort of three-legged stool of experience says to me, she has such credibility when she says, hey, superintendents, you can't be against everything. And you have an obligation to thank your legislators for when they do something that you agree with because they cannot only hear from you when you're opposed to something. God, you know, would love to hear that statement. I hope my colleague, Greg Meyer, who has been listening to all of our podcasts, hears that part of it. Cause I was like one. And when you do that, 
you get a person who is going to remember you when they're having the conversation in the legislature. That's going to happen. So good. I totally agree. I love hearing from Greg each week. I actually feel sad when I don't immediately hear from him. Which I'm like, if yeah, feedback, he's got a job. To, he's got a pretty big job aside from the work that he's already doing with the Equity Collaborative. Can yeah. you tell us what else does he do? Well, Greg Meyer is a state senator in, in the state of North Carolina, representing uh, Carborough, Orange, and Buncombe counties, I believe. But now I'm like, big That's, job. Yeah, big he's job. got a big job. He is a state legislator. I think Greg Meyer would make a spectacular superintendent. Spec. I believe it. I, I do. All right, we've done it. This is an Imperfect Leader, the Superintendents and Leadership Podcast. I'm Peter Stiefelman. And I'm Jamie Amlanson, and we will see you next week. Hey, Jamie, see you next week, folks. Yeah. Okay, bye. Music for an Imperfect Leader was written and arranged by Ian Varley. Sam Falbo created our artwork, a wood print inspired Daruba doll butterfly. Remember, Imperfect Leadership is not a scarlet letter. It's a badge of honor. It recognizes that serving as a lead learner is about being a vulnerable leader an empathetic leader, a compassionate leader. We are proud to be Imperfect Leaders. So join us next time for another episode of An Imperfect Leader, the Superintendent and Leadership Podcast. At the end of every interview that we have for teacher candidates, we will say, what questions do you have for us? And they will always ask, well, what kind of support can I expect? And we will always say, well, don't worry, we'll give you a mentor. But it's not real mentorship. I mean, it's support with the difficult kid or the field trip form or the grade card. But it isn't coaching. That's where partners like Ed Connective step in. They provide observation and feedback with practice. That's real coaching. Their mission is to ensure that every student thrives by facilitating exceptional educator growth. So whether it's science of reading, whether it's leadership development, whether you're trying to build the best recruitment and retention efforts, check out edconnective.com.